So, like, I've been working tirelessly on this review for close to two years now, meaning, uh, it's technically been in production longer than my first DDRC review, which was in production for about a year or so. Please be nice to me. Quick disclaimer, all background gameplay, unless stated otherwise, will be from Chad Conroy's Let's Play of the game back in 2017. I would love to use my own gameplay, but yes, capture cards nowadays are just... Uh, yeah, yeah. Right out of the gate, Pokemon Black and White are my favourite Pokemon games. And for as confident as I am in saying that, when Black and White were first released in 2011, it was quite a different story. In fact, at the time, coming off games like Platinum and Hard Gold and Soul Silver, I was initially indifferent to Black and White at best. But over the years, I slowly started to reevaluate my period, and eventually, they dethroned Platinum as my favourite Pokemon games. Well, Pokemon Black to clarify, because I've only ever really played Black, but you get the idea. I did a review on Pokemon Platinum back in October 2019, and even before then, I did a Why I Love video. Ooh, that's a uh, that's quite a throwback. Back in 2018 on Pokemon Black and White, so no matter how you look at things, me doing a proper review on the first half of Generation 5 was an inevitability, which, funny enough, brings us to today. And yes, I know I'm skipping over Hard Gold and Soul Silver, the, the games between Platinum and Black and White, but I can semi-assure you they will get their time in the spotlight one day, just not today. So strap in people on the internet, because this review is likely going to be a long one, especially when you consider how I went about reviewing Platinum and how highly you think of Black and White in comparison. And as you would guess by what I said a couple of paragraphs ago, going forward, my thoughts and opinions will all be on Pokemon Black. No need to worry though, they're not drastically different games, only having otherwise minor pieces of version exclusive content, but I will note those differences wherever I see fit. I see no point in stalling any further, so with that said, let's begin. This is my review of Pokemon Black. And White. Well, just Black. I, I already went over this. So before we talk about the actual game, I want to address the game's little opening animation. It's a good sense of foreshadowing for certain events in the story, and does a fantastic job of getting you excited for a brand new Pokemon adventure. And as a side note, Black and White's story has a larger focus on world building, a first for Pokemon games up to this point. So anyway, we start off in a cute little town overseeing a body of water called Novemba Town. Ah, uh, well, I, I guess it's more like a village, but we'll get into that later. This is our hometown in the region that is Unova, a region that's based around the New York City metropolitan area of America, which you can see many influences of in the region itself like Castilla City, for example, which is based on Lower Manhattan. But that aside for later, it is here in November Town that we are given the chance to choose our starter Pokemon, courtesy of a gift from this region's professor, Professor Juniper. And real quick, man, it's nice to have an actual female professor that isn't a side character or anything like that. It was really cool to see Game Freak start to diversify the cast more in terms of representation for major characters. It's also here that we introduce our childhood friends, Cheren and Bianca. Cheren is a rather to-the-point character, the type we've seen before in this series, you know the one. He wants to become stronger, and in his quest to become the Pokemon League champion. And as for Bianca, she's a strong and determined girl who, despite her father's wants, chooses to journey around the region of Unova in finding who she is. Cheryl and Bianca may seem kind of one notes at first, the former more so, but they do both generally get good character development throughout, which we'll touch more upon when it becomes relevant. But as I was saying, we're given the choice to choose between this region's starter Pokemon, Snivy, Oshawott and Tepic. Personally, I tend to go with Oshawott the most, but I will occasionally choose Tepic. Not Snivy though, it's Smuggle or haunts me. After choosing our new partner, we then battle our friends, Cheren and Bianca in two separate battles. And it is here where you'll notice how much faster this game is compared to the last generation, both in terms of battle speed and actual game speed, like, wow, if you're playing these games right after the Gen 4 ones, you're really going to notice the difference and be thankful for it. So anyway, after winning and trashing our room in the process, sorry mum, we're then given our Pokedex by Professor Juniper, who then leads us to Route 1 for the typical How to Capture a Pokemon tutorial. We then soon find out that you can't find the typical Route 1 encounters, but instead all new Pokemon. Yeah, instead of the regional decks being filled with past Pokemon amongst the new ones, this time around we have an original deck of 156 brand new Pokemon to play around with. This was quite a divisive decision amongst the community for a while, but Pokemon Black and White was originally intended as a series reboot, so that's why the exclusion of past Pokemon was a thing. And anyway, there are plenty of amazing Pokemon that were introduced in this generation, so it gives you a reason to experiment with new ones instead of falling into your usual traps, which I just love so much. Progressing into Akuna Town, we are greeted by the evil team for this game, Team Plasma, but not before we're taught about how Pokemon centers work, as if we didn't know that by this point. 
I'm not even going to bother being subtle about Team Plasma being the bad guys because just one city layer, we find out their true intentions anyway, so the game makes no real attempt to hide it. It is also here we are introduced to our third rival of source, the mysterious figure simply known as N. He challenges us to a battle and we beat him, of course, and then we're off to the next city, which is in the location of our first gym battle, Stratton City. The gym here is kind of a unique one, pitting you against one of three gym leaders, Silent, Chili or Crest, and depending on what starter you chose, you'll be pitted against the type your starter is weak to. So if you chose Oshawott, you'll be battling Silent, for example, the grass type leader in the trio. To make things a little easier for you, there's a trainer you can talk to in the dream yard up to the eastern starter that will give you a type monkey that complements your starter's type. So, for example, if you chose Oshawott, you'd be given a Panzer. It's just too bad that Pads is the worst of the three though. Honestly, the best type monkey you can get is Pample, in which you'd have to choose a Snivy as your starter, so... At least Snivy is good for something, I guess. Moving on though, soon we are tasked with collecting some Dream Mist from the Dream Yard to the east of Stratum for Scientist Fennel, a rather unique if short-lived side character, who also has cute official artwork, but that's besides the point. Anyway, it is here in the Dream Yard where we find out that Team Plasma are the bad guys. Whoa, who could have seen that one coming? And are just manipulating people into releasing their Pokemon so they can easily take over the world. As I said, the game makes no real attempt to even be subtle about their true intentions for long, which is kind of a shame, honestly. Nevertheless, when we're done recovering the Dream Mist and stopping Team Plasma, we head back to Fennel, who then rewards us with a Sea Gear. This generation's version of the Poketch, pretty much, from Generation 4. Unlike the Poketch, however, there really isn't much to Sea Gear, especially nowadays because Nintendo discontinued Wi Fi support for all Wii and DS games in 2014, but. I guess it looks pretty at least. Don't keep it on too often though, as wireless commu communication tends to drain DS and 3DS battery life way quicker, so neat incentive. But as soon as we receive our new mantelpiece, we are then off to the Green City, which is the location of our second gym bag. If you chose Tepig, you're going to have an easy time with this gym because it's a normal type one, and Tepig evolves into Grumpig and subsequently Emble, who are both part fighting type Pokemon. And sure, another firefighting type star for the third generation in a row was pretty tiring, but I'm not lying when I say that Emble is a pretty decent tanky Pokemon, so it could be worse honestly. If you chose either Snivy or Oshawott, you can go and catch a Timber or even a Sork or Throw, depending on which version you're playing, to the west of the Green. I would also recommend doing this, as Laura the gym leader has a team that, while not looking too dangerous at first, can be quite a hurdle this early on. Especially with her Watchhog almost guaranteed to open with Retaliate, which doubles in power on the first turn after a hurdier faint, so yeah, do be careful about that. Also, something important to note, Lenora was actually the first coloured gym leader in the series history up until this point, with later generations introducing other major characters like X and Y's Grant and Sword and Shield's Nessa. In fact, Gen 5 was the first to introduce characters of colour in general. I'm not exactly sure what took Game Freak so long on this, but hey, better late than ever, I guess. But once you, hopefully, overcome Lenora, you are then sent off to the next city, Castelia City, to get your third gym badge. But not before having to chase down some plasma grunts for stealing the head of a Dragonite skeleton, and which they mistook for a legendary dragon. See, I really like this moment a lot because, well, Dragonites aren't exactly native to the you know, region, so Team Plasma wouldn't know what one is, and that's how they mistook it for the legendary dragon. It's a really neat world building detail, honestly, because, yeah, they're kind of like trying to revive the legendary dragon and all. Soon after you recover the skull after trekking through the region's forest area, known as Pinball Forest, you then make your way to Castelia, not before crossing the Sky Arrow Bridge, which is a fantastic set piece, honestly. The music is upbeat and exciting, which, to segue into the music for a second, Pokemon Black and White has an amazing soundtrack. From the root themes to the wild Pokemon battle theme to the music that plays when you're when the gym leader is down to their last Pokemon, the soundtrack for the entire game is just so good. And while there were a lot of tracks I loved and planned them, I didn't love every single one there. But here, I can safely say that I love them all. My love for the soundtrack aside for the moment, back to the main story. Castilla City is probably the densest location in Univer overall. Having so many places to explore and buildings to go into that also have a number of floors too. You'll most likely be spending a lot of time here if you haven't played before, but in case you need advice for a decade old game, Jesus Christ, it's uh, these games have been out for over a decade now, oh my god. Just explore the docks first, and then the leftmost anyway, it's pretty simple honestly. And to touch on the scale of Castilla City, this is a Pokemon City location that feels like an actual city location. Large and dense. How many times throughout the series have city locations just felt like towns? More than like a town, honestly, which is a major problem with the Pokemon world and scale, such as the Vever Town from earlier feeling more like a village than anything. I can only hope that Pokemon Scarlet and Violet really take this kind of thing into account when it comes to their towns and cities, because installments after Black and White really didn't in a lot of cases. But anyway, you eventually locate the star of the artist himself, Burr, along with meeting a new character in Iris. If you've seen the anime, you know who Iris is, but her character is different here and not whatever they were thinking for the black and white anime. You act like a little kid. You are a little kid. What a kid. Axio! <laughs>
You're still a kid. You. You're such a kid. You don't have to go around acting like a little kid, you know. Ugh. My shared overwhelming indifference for the black and white anime aside, once we were able to defeat Burr, which, if the battle takes you a while, I wouldn't blame you at all. His signature Pokemon is a Levani, which is quite the hurdle this early on. In fact, Levani is a surprisingly good Pokemon in general. Honestly, you never really did justice for the bug type Pokemon, which are usually viewed as weak early game Pokemon, often falling off mid game, so thank you Gen 5 for finally giving this type some much needed love. The aforementioned Levani and Scolipede are two amazing bug types that immediately come to mind. Our next task is to then venture through Route 4, which is the designated desert area of this region. On this route, you can find some really great Pokemon like Sandal, who will eventually evolve into Crocodile, a fantastic dark ground type Pokemon, and Daramaka, who will evolve into Daramaka. Oh. Oh, oh. That's a way to mess that up. And Daramaka, who will evolve into Darmanitan, an amazing fire type, and my favourite Generation 5 Pokemon overall. I'm pretty sure I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again anyway. So basically, one time I sold my copy of Pokemon Black to a then friend for about £2.50 or about $3. I was quite a stupid kid back then, but that aside, a while later I wanted it back, to which I got it back, but not before bargaining for it. At which he tried to charge me literally 10 times the price and then settling on £5, or about $6. And as soon as I got it back, I proceeded to just marathon the game, picking up a Darumaku and soon Darmanitan on that playthrough, at which I eventually fell in love with over the course of the game with how much it absolutely decimated everything in its way, with a key instance of such being very late game, which I will note when we get to it. And so, yeah, that's how Darmanta became my favourite Gen 5 Pokemon. Story time over for now, let's get back to business. If you explore further into Route 4, you'll eventually find yourself in the Desert Resort, a training area essentially. But there is a point of interest here, the Relic Castle. There's not much here at first coming back into play later on, but you can get this Gen's fossil Pokemon here. Arkham from the Plume Fossil and Tertuga from the Cover Fossil. Out of these two, Arkham is the best choice, with eventually evolving into Archeops, which is an absolute beast of a Pokemon, though it is hindered by its ability, Defeatus, dropping all of its stats when its HP goes below half. It's kind of like slacking in a sense, where it can be fun to run, but there's quite a hurdle to overcome with it. So, upon venturing through Route 4, we arrive in Nimbasa City, where we are soon asked for help by this random old guy, who turns out to be the Daycare Man, to help protect him against Deep Team Plasma, who are causing a ruckus once more. After doing so, the daycare man then gives us the bike. This doesn't need an explosion, you know what the bike is and what it does, and that was it fast. Gotta go fast. Gen 5 game speed, everyone. But should you pursue the Team Plasma Grunts that ran off to the right into the theme park area of Nimbasa, you'll be confronted by N, who aids you in trying to find the Plasma Grunts. This leads you both to the Ferris wheel, where N asks you to ride it with him to try and get a better view. However, this all turns out to be a ruse, as this was just N's way of revealing to us that he's actually the king of Team Plasma. And has been this mysterious, kind of distant character up until this point, so learning he's the leader, essentially, of these troublemaking pariahs is one hell of a revelation. He then challenges you to a battle, and should you be able to defeat him, he reveals that he intends to become the lead champion so he can then command that every trainer release their Pokemon. This man's got him ambitions. So right anyway, Nimbasa is quite a lively place, having sports stadiums to the north of the city and a little theme park up to the east, where the next gym is also located. Now, should you explore Nimbasa for a while, which I'm sure you'll be inclined to do, you'll have an interaction with your friend, Bianca, who will show you this gen's Pokemon contest equivalent, the Musical Theatre. I don't honestly think much of the Musical Theatre, which is with it being a lesser version, the aforementioned contest, but I've never been a big fan of the Pokemon contest feature anyway, so musicals have always been a hard sell for me. After that little interlude though, Bianca is then confronted by her father, demanding that she stops her journey and comes back because of how dangerous it is for a kid to be wandering on their own in this world, which... Yeah, that's a pretty valid argument, to be completely honest. I mean, think about it, you've got these preachers of good faith, Team Plasma, going around and trying to hurt people, and the fact that, well, Pokemon are just dangerous beings in general. However, after being persuaded by Nimbasa's gym leader, Elisa, in a very touching moment, Bianca's father steps down and agrees to let Bianca find her own way in life, instead of being overly protected. I covered this little segment in my I Love Video Game Music video specifically, the importance of unwavering emotions, the track that plays during the scene, and how it just wouldn't be the same without it. Overall, it's just such an amazing and surprisingly heartfelt moment, setting a precedent for future emotional moments in the series. After we're done having a little cry, Nimbasa's gym is our next target. The gym is run by Elisa, as I've mentioned, and it's also just a massive roller coaster attraction, making it one of the more memorable gyms in the game. After riding enough roller coasters to make ourselves sick, we challenge Elisa for the electric badge. And if you were thinking you could just breeze through this gym with a sandal you probably caught on Route 4, nope. Elisa has two emulgers, and they're part flying type, meaning they're immune to ground type moves, so have fun working around them. 
Assuming you are able to decimate the flying Pikachus, you then offer your fifth gym badge, with the gym being located in Jiffel City and uh there's not a lot I can say about Jiffel's theme that hasn't been said before, I mean come on. As I said earlier, the Generation 5 games have amazing soundtracks. The composers really didn't have to go this hard for them, but by Arceus they did. Regardless of the funky theme, our next gym battle is against Clay. Clay is a ground type gym leader if you can tell from his name, so if you have any water type or grass type Pokemon, like Samurai or Superior, which you should have by this point if you chose either of them, then this gym should be a breeze for you. Afterwards, your task with helping Sharon chase down some Team Plasma Grunts who have chosen to hide out in the cold storage, a location to the south of Driftdale, with one of the Seven Sages, Zinzelin. Oh, right, I forgot about the Seven Sages. To be honest, they really don't have any major relevance in the main story here, other than one thing that comes up much later on, and serve as fetch quests in the post-game, really, so, yeah. Really, they exist solely to give Team Plasma a sense of structure as, a, as an organisation, and nothing else. But to be fair, and to jump the gun a little here, Zizzlin does have a larger role in the sequels, Black 2 and White 2, but those are those and this is now. Maybe I'll talk about it in future, but not for a long while. Anywho, after that main story side quest, god what is this tournament, we're off to the Mistralton City, which in all honesty can be argued to be more of a town than a city because of its size, but because it has an airport, it is classed as one. My E in geography aside, hang on, before we actually get to the Mistralton, we have to venture through Chargestone Cave, which is inhabited by some great electric type Pokemon in Joltic, Tynamo and Clink, which eventually evolve into Galvantula, Electros and Clinklang respectively. Conveniently enough, the Mistralton Gym run by Skylar is a flying type gym, and considering that flying types are weak to the electric type, I recommend you take advantage of the fact. Besides, a Garvantula with Compound Eyes, an ability that slightly boosts accuracy by a factor of 1.3 times, is a lot of fun to run because of Thunder, which is normally only 7% accurate, but will be boosted to 91% accurate with the ability. It's so much fun to abuse, honestly. The thoughtful game design are giving you the option of making your time easy before an upcoming challenge by presenting you with Pokemon that have the type advantage over the next gym type is something I really admire. To add here real quick, just before you leave Charge Stone into Mistralton, you're once again confronted by N, who proceeds to challenge you to another battle. After the battle, N asks you whether you have a dream or not. Picking either one will result in different dialogue and N showing you a different attitude towards you throughout the rest of the game, depending on which one you chose. Nothing too significant, but it's a neat, easily missable detail. And maybe you've noticed it, but if not, N's been all about the suffering of Pokemon, denoting battling with them as one of the main contributors of this, but yet, he's still partaking in battles. Weird, right? Well, see, he's only battling when he has to, only using Pokemon from the immediate area, releasing them afterwards. It's why he has a different team each time you battle him. It's such a well thought out workaround, I love it. Moving swiftly on, once we're able to topple Skylar, not before seeking her out at the Celestial Tower, a resting place for deceased Pokemon located to the north of Route 7, in other words, the destination unsettling area that every Pokemon game seems to have, we then have to venture through Twist Mountain, a more complex cave system than the last, and one of the many locations in Unibur which can change drastically depending on what season of year it is. Yeah, that's right, Pokemon Black and White introduced dynamic seasons, with them mostly winter, being able to literally change the landscape of a location. The four seasons run under a monthly rotation as a to being every three months like in the real world, making the game a little more accessible, which is much appreciated. It's a real shame this mechanic was scrapped just a generation later, but mechanics not returning in future games is something that's unfortunately commonplace in the series, and the justification for it is not a valid one of that. That's not a topic I want to get into right now though, so let's just continue on. Once we traverse our way through Twist Mountain, we find ourselves in Icarus City, fight me on the pronunciation, which is also the location of our next gym badge, and much like the last gen, this 7th gym is an ice type one, led by Bryson the Ice Ninja. Yeah, he's an Ice Ninja, how cool is that? Bryson's gym is also another pretty memorable one, at least for me, because despite being another ice sliding puzzle in the series, there's just straight up a huge gap that trainers could easily fall down that you jump over. Where are the child's safety regulations in this world? Of course, with Bryson being an ice type gym leader, he's pretty easy to overcome because of how weak the ice type is defensively. But me being salty about one of my favourite types being super weak in reality is a topic for another day, because when we're able to conquer the gym, we catch wind that shit's about to go down at Dragon's Flower Tower, with N attempting to awaken one of our legendary dragons, so being the obedient sun protagonist that we are, we make our way all the way up to the top of the Dragon's Flower Tower, only to find out that N was successful. N soon informs us that he's off to take on the Pokemon League and defeat the champion, Alder. I haven't at all mentioned Alder up until this point, but he's your traditional kind of foreshadowing that happens in Pokemon games, where you'll see him throughout your adventure before finally facing him at the Pokemon League. 
Back to the point at hand, should he defeat Elder, Emery reaffirms he'll demand that every trainer in the universe release their Pokemon at once. Now, how M thinks he'd be able to do this is honestly beyond me, considering that, well, you know, free will is kind of a thing, but I guess he could put sanctions in place or something, but even then, up until this point, he's never come off as that authoritative. Nevertheless, upon learning this, we are sent on a wild goose chase of sorts in an attempt to find either the light or dark stone, depending on which version you're playing, so that we may be able to awaken the other legendary dragon, in Black's case, Reshiram, and in White's case, Zekrom. The first sends us to, or back to, the desert resort on Route 4 into the Relic Castle, much further into it than we could go before. It's here, in a conversation with Gets This, we find out a little more about Older. See, he's actually got a bit of character depth to him, in that he's become lost after a beloved partner of his, a colony, died, and uh, a direct reference to death in the Pokemon series, that's the first. After that, we're then caught in the Queen City, where we're then just given the light, or dark stone, by Lenora, previously thinking it was just a pretty looking stone. That's honestly funny to me. However, in need to learn more about the Orb of Magic, we are sent off to Opelousa City to ask Draydon, the city's gym leader and also a dragon tamer, about how we could possibly awaken the respective dragon. I said I would note any major version differences, and this is one of those. Opelousa City is very different depending on what version you're playing. In white, Opelousa is an old and historical city, while in black, it's a modern futuristic city that also has a rocking theme. When we first arrive at Opelousid, we find Getsus, Team Plaster's mouthpiece you could say, delivering a speech to the people of Opelousid, much like how he did way back in Akuma Town. I've neglected to talk about Getsus much up, up until this point, but mostly because I couldn't find the right spot to do so, but Getsus has always been a looming figure during our journey, one with a mysterious, almost powerful presence wherever he goes, always having a sinister vibe to him, and by extension because of him, Team Plasma. In my opinion, it is because of Getsus that Team Plasma feels like a threat at all, which really speaks to his role in the story. As soon as gets this and his lock clear out, we are left with Drayden and a familiar face, Iris. Yeah, remember her from Castilla City? But anyway, we meet up with Drayden and we are soon challenging him to a battle in his absolute nightmare of a gym, in Pokemon Black. See, another piece of version exclusive content here is that, in white, instead of battling Drayden for your final gym match, you battle Iris instead, which in my opinion is so much better for multiple reasons, but mainly because you'll probably be seeing her again in future. I wonder what that could mean. So after beating a child in Pokemon White, wow that sounds super messed up out of context, we have earned our final gym badge and now must make our way to the Pokemon League to try and stop N. Before we are able to head out to Route 10, the route that leads to the Victory Road and subsequently the Pokemon League, Professor Juniper wishes us luck in our final steps and gives us a Master Ball. Now, if you think she gave you it to capture the Legendary Dragon should you awaken it, bear with me here, I'll explain why you don't need to waste it on either Restaurant or Zekrom later. But with that, we head out to Route 10, which, surprise surprise, has amazing music, getting you excited for the final stages of your Pokemon journey. A little into the route, we are confronted by both Cheren and Bianca, the former challenging us to a battle one last time. As for Cheren, I kind of forgot to really mention his development throughout the game, but he learns that there's more to Pokemon than being a trainer than just being strong. And as for Bianca, she admits she can't beat us and wishes us luck instead, also mentioning how she's found other ways of helping out in the world that doesn't just involve battling, and she also gives us a few max of eyes. You know, I gotta wonder how she was able to get a hold of these, because they're kinda like the rarest item, it just in the Pokemon universe, but I guess she just got super lucky with her Pokemon's pick up ability or something. She also says she senses something is wrong, so she goes looking for help. Honestly, compared to Cheren, Bianca's the better rival in my opinion. There are other ways of growing as a person than just through battling in the Pokemon world after all, and I'm glad the games explored that idea. Soon after, we're making our way into Victory Road, and it has probably one of the best sequences of eligibility recognition in any Pokemon game. It really makes you feel like you can take on anything, a powerful show of how far you come in your adventure. It's easily one of my favourite moments in any Pokemon game. With that very memorable moment behind us, after we make it through the very vertical Victory Road, we are finally at the Pokemon League, and for the first time in the series, we can actually choose which Elite Four member we challenge first, adding a great sense of replayability, which is always nice. But to elaborate a little more, the Elite Four members specialise in the following types from left to right. Chantal specialises in the Ghost type, Grimsley specialises in the Dark type, Caitlyn specialises in the Psychic type, and Marshall specialises in the Fighting type. Two interesting points to note here. One, the presence of a Dark type specialist is the first for the series, so that's going Grimsley. And second, if Caitlyn seems familiar, you aren't just imagining things. She's actually a returning character, first appearing in the Gen 4 games as head of the Battle Castle in the Battle Frontier, so that's really cool. 
Oh, and I just found this out, but there's apparently a 12 year difference between the Gen 4 games and Black and White because, well, Caitlyn was only 14 in Gen 4, she's 26 here, so if you cared about continuity at all, there you go, but damn, she's had quite a life. So after we, hopefully, trounce the Elite 4 with their awesome battle theme, we're ready to head into the Champions Room. But, once we climb the massive staircase, a consistent motif throughout the Gen 5 Elite 4, we make an alarming discovery. N succeeded in defeating Older. N then gives us a small speech about what he desires to do next, before summoning a castle from the very ground around the league in what was another very memorable moment in Pokemon Black and White. Side note here, Pokemon Black and White is really unique in its structure with the typical Pokemon game formula, this being the key example. You may have defeated the Elite Four, normally the penultimate step in your journey, leaving only a champion, but now you've got a whole other challenge ahead of you. Upon entering Anne's castle, you are first reached by the Seven Sages, because yeah, that's still a thing, but here they're at the most dangerous. You're cornered, and the odds aren't looking good for you. Until... This is a truly awesome moment. Bianco had ventured around to all the gym leaders, telling them how you would likely need help, and there they are, ready to help you out. Except Sal and Trillian Crest though, but I guess Bianca wasn't able to make it to them in time. But anyway, this sequence really makes these otherwise side characters have major plot relevance to the story, more so considering how they all had their own personal runners with Team Plasma previously in the story in some way or form. Except Skylar, but whatever. <laughs> Following that awesome moment, advancing more into the castle, you're somewhat guided around by Team Plasma's Shadow Triad, with one instance of this leading you to End's childhood room. This place resonates a rather unsettling aura, even if just for the music that plays here, a feeling that becomes all the more significant in hindsight. That notwithstanding, we head up to the final floor, ready to confront N in his throne room, to which he soon summons his legendary dragon to accompany him in a really cool sequence. However, all of a sudden, our Dark Souls Lightstone we have been carrying around with us starts to react. N then explains to us that either a Reshiram or Zekrom is waiting for us to challenge it, so that it can see if we have the potential to harness its power, much like how a lot of the other story related legendary Pokemon are. Not hesitating, we then challenge the respective legendary dragon, all the while another awesome battle theme plays. Now, you're probably going to be tempted to just use the Master Ball right off the bat to end the battle quickly, but you really don't need to. See. Reshiram and Zekrom have a catch rate of 45 over 255, so if you were to use a quick ball on the first turn, which multiplies the catch rates by 5 times, if done so, then increasing their catch rate to 225 over 255, you're almost guaranteed to catch it. Yep, you can just use a quick ball to catch the mascot legendary and save your precious mascot ball for something later, like a Roman legendary or whatever. It's likely something most people aren't aware of because of how instinctive it is to just use the Master Ball on a legendary Pokemon and how most legendaries have a catch rate of 3. And you know what, I wasn't aware of this fact even until Cherry Combo explained that you could in his LP of Black and White, so yeah, that's really cool. It should also be noted that unlike other Pokemon games like Platinum for example, you don't get to fight the mascot legendary Pokemon until AFTER you've beaten the Pokemon League which really brings together this climax and tops off with a nice little bow. Pacing is always important to me in the story, and it's something I've had an issue with in a lot of Pokemon games, where the story will climax all before you take on the 8th gym, so for Pokemon Black and White to deviate from the usual formula and to pull it off so flawlessly as well, that's something I just adore. And then they just reverted back to the old ways one game later, but one game at a time here. Should you capture the legendary dragon which, considering the number of failsafes in place, you really shouldn't have an issue, and then challenge you to one final battle. The battle theme that plays here is quite something already known as Decisive Battle, N, but there exists an official remix of the theme which was only officially available on the OST at the time, and not anywhere else, called N to the Power of N, and man, it's so good. It's such a shame that this wasn't the theme used instead. It's playing in the background right now anyway, so you've had time to listen to it, but still. It's really in intense and high energy, and it really fits the feeling of a final battle where everything is on the line. Should you be able to overcome N, you are then soon confronted by Getsis, who proceeds to ridicule and attack N's character for being a failure. And if it wasn't obvious before, this is where we learn that Getsis has been pulling the strings the whole time, using N as a puppet to bring his evil skins to fruition, having raised him since he was charged and brainwashed him somewhat to do what he never could. It goes without saying, but Getsis is probably one of the most messed up villains in the entire mainline Pokemon series because of this. With his patience at its limit, Getsis takes us on in a prompty battle, but not before N is able to heal our Pokemon back to health. Getsis' theme isn't as high energy as N's, but 
damn is it a fierce one. It does a great job of conveying a sense of urgency and a feeling of desire and revenge for what he's done to Ren. Also, notice how the theme bears a resemblance in part to Arceus' battle theme in terms of tempo, rhythm and feeling. Speaking of how Getsis has this kind of god complex about him, Getsis' team is extremely balanced and versatile, so it's understandable if you struggle or even lose on your first attempt. It's here, by the way, that the Domanita I mentioned in my little story from way earlier came in clutch and just decimated Getsis. I mean, it was a Domanita and I don't know what I was expecting. <laughs> but should you pull through and claim victory over Getsis, you're done. Getsis is shortly taken away and you are left alone with N. After a brief few moments of N recapping the times he met up with you and reflecting on his life a little, depending on whether you reply with yes or no to when N asked you if you had a dream back in Chargestone Cave, you'll get unique dialogue here and even then, the dialogue you get is slightly different depending on what version you're playing. And then, N bids you farewell before flying off with his legendary dragon, promptly followed by the credits. Quite a conclusion, huh? But we're not done yet, as we've still got the post-game to talk about. Don't worry, there's not really any further story development in the post-game, I just think it's worth mentioning for being one of the better post-games in the series. So when you load back into the game, you'll head downstairs to discover that you now have two moms all of a sudden. Don't worry though, this isn't one of those weird videos you can find on um, <coughs> uh, various sites as one of them is actually the return looker in disguise. He'll brief you on the fact he's conducting a search for N in the Seven Sages, and ask you for your help, before giving you a super up because, yeah, about time we got a fishing run in this game, huh? And so it's pretty much your job, and well, your job alone, to journey around the entire region in order to find the Seven Sages. Making the task a whole lot easier is the fact you can now access the east side of the region when you previously couldn't in the main story, so, more adventuring! Seeing as you can now explore the east side of the region, also now allowing you to find Pokemon in your national decks, let's talk about the new locations you can explore. It should also be mentioned that in the east side of the region over, the difficulty kind of spikes, with trainers having Pokemon as high as level 65, so yeah, be careful not to get curve stomped by the trainer with a level 65 Krogon to the east of Opelousa. The first major one here is the location to the right of the Basin City, which is dependent on what version you're playing, being either of Black City in Pokemon Black or White Forest in Pokemon White. And straight up, Black City sucks, I'm not even going to bother with this one. White Forest on the other hand, this is where the money's at. See, now that you're in the post game, you, as I've mentioned, have access to the national decks, meaning you can now capture a whole array of Pokemon from previous generations, and White Forest is a key place for them. In fact, because of the Pokemon you can capture in White Forest and not Black City because that place sucks, Pokemon White has 34 more version exclusive Pokemon than Black. And what's strange is that Pokemon Black wanted to sell more copies than Pokemon White, so I really feel bad that more people experienced Black City than people did White Forest. That's the majority really got done dirty, man. I'm extra sorry about it because I originally asked for Pokemon White when the games were first released because I liked Zekrom's design more at the time, but my parents got me Pokemon Black instead. I guess there was a bit of communication or something, but hey. But anyway, you can catch a lot of Pokemon here, should you choose to, but they will also be level 5, so if you really want any of them on your team, you will have to do some grinding. But you know, there are some pretty good Pokemon here, like Rolt, Slackoff, Bergen, and Shinx, my baby. So, it's entirely up to you, of course. Next up is Undale Town. This place is just a nice little summer resort area that's not exactly got a lot to it, other than being a genuinely nice place just to hang out. But, there is something of interest here. Or rather, someone. Sure to remember that. Let's go into our first house and see what happens. Crap! Yep, your generation 4 trauma and mine has returned, and she's more than ready to fold your ass once again. Cynthia being in Pokemon Black and White is such a great inclusion. Even when she's not the champion of the region and is just on vacation, she's still the best trainer there. God, I love her. So upon that pleasant surprise and or fright, the next location to address is Lacanosa Town. This town is just a quaint little place to wander through, really. There's not much to it in terms of actual substance, but in terms of lore, this is where Lacanosa gets interesting. Okay, well, the town itself doesn't really have any lore go for it, so it's more by extension than anything. But that aside, the residents of Lacanosa Town believe in a legend that states that the a monster of sorts, comes out at night to eat people, which is in reference to the monster that lives in the giant chasm, a location to the northeast of Lacanosa, this monster being Kyurem. To just quickly touch on Kyurem here, it's quite a mysterious Pokemon. Rumored to have come from space, it's actually the link between the two legendary dragons, Reshiram and Zekrom, as they were once just one Pokemon within the lore of the universe region, so when they were uh, separated, Kyurem was what remained of their power. Kyurem being this husk of what remains is super creepy honestly, and the fact that it's just kind of, well, there in a cave is really unsettling. See, I told you that the Generation 5 games focus heavily on world building, but yeah, I believe that does it for what I want to talk about for the post game, so now I think it's time to finish things up. 
So, I already said this at the beginning of the view, just right out of the gate, but I love Pokemon Black and White. From aspects such as the surprisingly engaging story, and by extension the more mature take on a Pokemon story too, to many of the memorable locations and or moments throughout, the absolutely amazing soundtrack of these games, which, to highlight some of my favourites once more, they include Unwavering Emotions, the Wild Pokemon Battle theme, Driftvale City's theme, Pokemon Black's Opelucency theme, the Gym Leader's Final Pokemon theme, the Elite Four theme, the Mascot Legendary theme, the Cypher's Battle M, and Get Citizens Battle theme. All these and more make the experience of playing through Pokemon Black and White just an amazing one. And I briefly touched on this towards the beginning of the main review, but many, many of the new Pokemon that were introduced in Pokemon Black and White are also amazing. There are truly so many good Pokemon here. One of the other native Texas, there'd be only a few highlights and the rest would be afterthoughts. But in Black and White, not so much. Sure, you have Pokemon like Type Monkeys, but you also have Pokemon like Crocodile, Chandelure, Levani, Lil Lilligant, Whimsicott, Selgor, Scolipede, Volcarona, Excadrill, Darmanitan, Arceus, Reuniclus, Electros, Hydreigon, Bisharp, Golok. I could go on and on, honestly. On my last playthrough of Pokemon Black back in 2021, my team consisted of a Superior, yes, I actually used this in Ivy, I was just memeing earlier, a Haxorus, a Siglyph, an Excadrill, a Semipore, and a Gigalith. And a fun little tidbit, this team was used for a speedrun attempt of the game that clocked over just 9 hours I think? Not exactly speedrun material I'm aware, not to mention I kinda cheated by trading up a much higher level Pokemon from a white 2 save belt, but whatever, it was still a bunch of fun. Now sure, the games have problems, like not doing more of a few of the side characters, namely Fennel, having the motives of Team Plasma just spoon fed you really early on as opposed to being subtle about it, and going on a wild goose chase in the post game for the Seven Sages, characters you likely never cared about to begin with, but the negative issues are minuscule when compared to the positives of these games. They're not perfect, I hope I made it clear that I don't think that, but at the end of the day, nothing is perfect. Expecting stuff to be perfect all the time will only lead to disappointment, and to truly love something, you have to be able to acknowledge its flaws first, I believe. And that applies to just about everything, games, movies, books, even people. Sometimes, not everything is so black and white.